Hi folks, Scott Sager with you here again today in the RTC TV4 studios. Today I've got a gentleman with me, Danny Says. He's running for Superior Court Judge here in Fulton County. Welcome, Danny. Thank you, Scott. Good to be here. Well, this is my first time meeting Danny, his first time in the studio, so we're going to jump right in and uh, just kind of start to talk a little bit about you. Um, so you're running for Superior Court Judge. That's correct. So you're an attorney here in Fulton County in Rochester? I am for going on 10 years. 10 now. years. Excellent. Where are you from originally? Well, anybody from Michigan knows that the first <laughs> thing we do is we do this. And I'm from just uh, north of Benton Harbor, Michigan, okay. a town called Coloma, Michigan, former home of Deer Forest. Oh, wow. Anybody remembers back in the day? Okay. Deer Forest. And my dad had a restaurant there. No kidding. And I dumped fries and slapped burgers <laughs> for him and helped him make donuts at night. Wow. And uh, uh, graduated from there in 1978. Wow, excellent, excellent. So uh, a Michiganite come down. We'll, we'll say you're still from the Michiana area, if we will. I am. <laughs> Very good. So um, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, where'd you go to school? Where'd you go to college, law school? What'd you do in life, military service at all? Well, if you got two hours, <laughs> because it's kind of a tortured story. So um, I... I uh, Spent four years in the military. Okay. I enlisted in the Army, and after finishing infantry basic and AIT, uh, advanced individual training in Fort Benning, Georgia, mm -hmm. I went to jump school, oh. and then got ready to go to Panama, where my orders were cut, and uh, my plane blew out its brakes in Denver to pick me up, so I called all panicky to uh, the Air Force base I was supposed to fly into. Uh, I think in North Carolina, and an Air Force guy answers the phone and says, Panama, right? I said, yeah. He says, no, you're not. We've frozen everybody who's going over there. And I asked, where am I going to? And he said, come talk to me. <laughs> so that's a long-winded way of saying I wound up in Berlin, Germany. Wow. Uh, while the wall was still up, it was 110, 110 miles inside of East Germany. Wow. And I was there uh, in the mid-80s. I was there when Ronald Reagan came to town. I was in the crowd when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down these walls. Oh, wow. When I left uh, the military in uh, uh, late in the summer of 1987, okay. I enrolled in the University of Michigan. Okay. I spent four years there. Um, got to watch the Rocket Ismail ran two kickoff returns for touchdowns <laughs> against Michigan for Notre Dame. It was a great Notre Dame win. Uh, and that was also the game where a tall, lanky kid came out for an injured quarterback, a kid named Elvis Gerback. Wow. And we heard 110,000 people chanting Elvis, Elvis. <laughs> and from University of Michigan, then I went to the University of Iowa for law school. Okay. And... Uh, I was on an accelerated program, so I was going to graduate from law school in two years, except there was this thing called the Gulf War that started up. Mm. And I had uh, picked up a commission through the ROTC program, and so I was activated okay. halfway through law school. No kidding. I had to go down and spend six months in Fort Huachuca. I never went overseas. And uh, when that training was over, then I returned to law school and graduated on time with my peers in 93. Wow. And at that point, I didn't feel like I wanted to be an attorney. Mm. And so I went into the world of business and I worked for a number of large insurance companies, State Farm, the Zurich, Lloyd's of London, Wow! over the next 10 years or so, and lived all over the country. And uh, it so happened that a job opened up in uh, uh, Indiana and allowed us to return from where we'd been living in Utah to Indiana. Wow. And so we came back to Indiana in 2004, and I realized after about five years, I probably needed to be looking at what else I might do. Mm -hmm. And so one of the few smart things I've done, I guess, is I took the bar exam, worked full-time, studied full-time, mm -hmm. and took the bar exam, and in 2008, I... Uh, got my law license, and in January of 2009, uh, I rented a room above WROI. <laughs> Thank you, Tom and Sue yeah, Bear. No and uh, started my career as an attorney that and have great. not looked back since. That is fantastic. Now, you've got an office that's uh, on north or south end of town on Main Street here in I Rochester, do, correct? at the corner What's of 16th and Main, 16th right next to Rochester 
glass. Yeah, right across the street there. Excellent, excellent. So what type of law have you been practicing in general? Has it been, you know, the, the large box or very specialized? And it's, it's pretty hard to be super specialized when you're a small town attorney. Okay. Um, I've really been handling the needs of the community in the county. Yeah. Um, all kinds of family law needs mm -hmm. from things not so happy like divorces to happy things like adoptions. Excellent. Uh, been doing criminal defense, helping people with financial issues, doing bankruptcies, some things like that. So been doing quite a quite a lot of different kinds of Excellent. cases. Yeah, you have a nice menagerie in a small town, right, to keep you busy. So talk about um, Superior Court Judge. The position, uh, you know, our viewers, some don't know how the courts are broken out. Of course, we have Circuit and then we have Superior. We've had some interviews, and if you've been paying attention and taking copious notes like you should, you will re remember that there's a differentiation as to what they see and what type of cases they see. You want to talk about that a little bit, about what the Superior Court judge is going to be seeing and what type of cases they'll be presiding over? Sure, Scott, not a problem. Well, the Circuit Court, which is Judge Christopher Lee uh, handles uh, estates, probate work, uh, juvenile delinquencies, um, uh, child services cases. We call them child in need of services cases, chins cases. Um, whereas the Superior Court handles all the small claims, all the traffic okay. uh, uh, tickets, issues. Um, the Superior Court handles all of the misdemeanors in the county. Uh, it splits felonies equally with the circuit court. Okay. So mathematically, I guess that means that the Superior Court handles most of the criminal cases in um, Fulton County. Uh, both courts can handle divorces. Both courts can handle general kinds of lawsuits like uh, auto accidents, that sort of a thing. So you'll see both handling that. But the heavy emphasis for the Superior Court is going to be uh, criminal cases. Okay, good to know, good to know. So, why now? Why throw your head in the ring at this point? Is it just a time in life? Is it because it's Wayne is retiring and there's an opportunity here? Your career path, what's brought you to this point? Well, I've got to tell you that, you know, in the course of these last 10 years, I've seen how the criminal justice system impacts people. And I think mm -hmm. we all need to realize that when we talk about criminal justice, for the most part, we're not talking about strangers. We're talking about our husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, mm -hmm. people that we know. And we know that people make mistakes. It doesn't necessarily make them bad people, but they do make mistakes. And uh, over the 10 years, it's just come to me that uh, we can do a better job of reducing the impact and the burden of the court on people, on offenders. Uh, that's not to say that we're going to be soft on crime. Right. Uh, but what it means is to use more evidence-based uh, methods when we sentence people. Do we really need to send them to jail or can we put them on a work release program? Can we put them on in-home detention and monitor them with an ankle bracelet? Mm -hmm. Can we put them on probation? For people who are dangerous, uh, of course we're, we're going to keep them in jail and we're going to give them a long time out for those serious kinds of crimes. But for the most part, we don't have too many of those. Mm -hmm. uh, what I like to say is, you know, anything that happens in the big city happens here too, mm -hmm. just not as often. All right. But for the most part, uh, if you look at the people that are in jail, they're mostly low-level drug offenders. Um, nonviolent. Nonviolent. Um, and uh, those are people that I think that uh, we don't need to fill the jail with. We can monitor them, monitor them supervise them, um, in, a, in a smarter and more cost-effective way. Excellent. In May, when uh, Andy Holland, the head of probation, got up in a meeting, he said at that time that their in-home detention program was only being used at approximately 25% of its capacity. Wow. That's not an achievement. I see. So it shows that we have the ability to, to use some of those methods mm -hmm. more. There are other things that uh, Judge Lee would like to do that he's going to need a partner I see. with. 
like drug court. Mm -hmm. It's a specialized kind of court mm -hmm. that we use for drug offenders mm -hmm. that has had success in other areas of the state as well as um, across the country. Mm -hmm. Just uh, and, and you talk about drug court. I've, I've heard about some of these. Of course, if you watch the legal minute that we do with Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins, we will sometimes talk about drug court. And that's just a specialized system that you handle the drug cases with. It's, it's no different. It's just a little more systematized and a little more specialized on what you're doing, how the program works with, within the drug court, how you see these people, right? So at present, do we have a drug court set up per se in Fulton County? We do not. Okay, so it's a separate thing. Well, very good. Well, go ahead, please. Well, I, if I could, I, there's some very interesting statistics about addiction, for yeah. instance. Uh, last year I was attending a class and we learned that it'll take the average person anywhere from four to seven times to successfully rehabilitate really? from heavy drug use. Interesting. Um, we know that through, um, uh, oh, what's MRI scans, mm -hmm. that the brain literally changes from heavy drug use and it takes about a year before the brain starts to balance itself back out mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the chemicals mm -hmm. that, that it secretes, which is a big deal for people struggling with addiction. And what we've learned statistically, again, is, and I keep talking about statistics because that's evidence. That's, mm -hmm. Those are numbers that we can use and apply and know that we're using the best methods Absolutely. available to us. Absolutely. We know that length of sentence has very little to do with whether a person successfully rehabilitates or not. Okay. Instead, it is the fear of that person of immediate consequences mm -hmm. that is more of a deterrent. In other words, the the, the fear of a long-term sentence has less to do with whether a person uh, uh, avoids a substance than the fact that they're going to be caught immediately and mm -hmm. there's going to be an immediate consequence. Mm -hmm. So an immediate consequence may be a week in jail, mm -hmm. having to face the judge, explain themselves, um, that's where drug courts come in. Gotcha. And they start to use more of those those methods that do work. Mm -hmm. Because nice. ultimately, it's in our best interest as a community that people are able to uh, to uh, rehabilitate themselves, mm -hmm. become employed, mm -hmm. support themselves, their mm -hmm. families, uh, become taxpayers, mm -hmm. uh, and contribute to the community. It's, it's in our collective best interest mm -hmm. uh, that people return to the community and become productive. Amen. Amen. And of course, you've got the situation where I want their tax dollars. I want them their tax dollars to help our community. I want their volunteer services. I want their abilities. Um, we, we talk about this a lot on RTC TV4, how we're all capable and able people. Um, how we choose to utilize those skills and resources is, is up to each of us individually. And, and uh, of course, we highlight the volunteers here, but you're right. It is in our collective good to get these people rehabilitated and back in as productive members of society, quote unquote. So a very good take there. Well, we have Danny Says in here today. Danny's running for Superior Court Judge here in Fulton County. He'll be on your election ballot November 8th. Danny, anything else you want to tell the folks, the viewers out there today? Yes, I would be so wrong if I didn't put a shout out to my wife of 35 years, <laughs> Robin. I have four children who are all out of the house. Thank you. Um, and want you to know that uh, I do support law enforcement. My youngest son is uh, a Utah State Trooper. He's also currently deployed to Afghanistan right now, so our family knows what it is to serve. Yeah. Uh, my oldest son is uh, an employee of the, of the FBI. I've got two amazing daughters as well, and uh, I, I'd just be wrong if I didn't mention how how, how proud I am of them and, and my great love for them. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. We got we got to talking on some other subjects. I didn't deal into the family too much, but excellent. Well, a family man here, Danny says he's on your election ballot this November 8th. Give him some consideration, and as always, thanks for watching here. We'll have more political interviews for you on RTC TV4. Thanks again for watching.